One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. End of test. This is in contact with a test. One, Roger, you're locked. Clear here. Hold on. Christmas, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Galactic Chloe Show. For the occasion, we are meeting with someone from the EPFL Valley community, Professor Wendy Queen, an accomplished scientist at the crossroads of chemistry and material science. Hi, Wendy. How are you doing? Great. And how are you? Very good. Uh, did you meet Santa on your way to Omwin campus? In fact, I did see him. He was talking to some engineering students. They were trying to work out how he was still going to fly his sleigh with the reindeer space so that they could maintain social distancing. Well, I hope he can also uh, come and uh, see the moon sometime. Me too. So we're arriving at the end of the year 2020, which was uh, quite difficult for all of us. And I, I get the feeling that we are needing or, or hoping for a better tomorrow. It's something you're trying to do with your research, right? Absolutely, that's the case. So basically what my group is doing is we're designing special sponge type materials. And so really the, the emphasis of our research is to implement these sponges in a variety of different processes. Uh, specifically, we're trying to implement these sponges in gas and liquid based separations. And they're extremely important in several uh, globally relevant separations, and that is carbon dioxide capture and water purification. And could you, could you tell us a bit more about the current state of those issues here on Earth? Of course. So as we know, global warming is an extremely problematic issue at the moment. So um, what's happening is basically um, carbon dioxide is increasing in our atmosphere. And this is known as a greenhouse gas. This is one of the main culprits behind global warming. And this carbon dioxide is actually coming from man-based activities, uh, namely energy production. So we burn fossil fuels in order to produce energy at power plants and also in our automobiles. And what happens is basically we release that CO2 into the atmosphere. And of course, as the CO2 concentrations are increasing, our global temperatures are warming, and this is having very grave effects on our surrounding environment. And so one of those um, effects, of course, is uh, decreased access to, to things like fresh water, which is extremely important to sustain human life. And so with continued climate change, we have the expectation that um, our access to clean water is going to continually decline. And at the moment, about only 11% of our global population has access to clean water. So these are very important issues. And how does your research tackle those issues? So our research, as I mentioned, is focused on the design of sponges. Of course, this is a normal kitchen sponge that you might use to wash dishes. Um, the types of sponges that we're actually designing um, is focused on air and water purification. So we, we decorate these sponges in a certain way that we can um, selectively grab certain contaminants from either gases or from liquids. And so you can imagine that we can design a sponge to take um, really toxic things out of water like lead and mercury as well as toxic organics for instance. And it, it doesn't look like that? No, in fact it doesn't. Would you like to see it? Yeah. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? SpongeBob SquarePants! Absorbent and yellow and porous is he? So our sponges actually look more like this. They're really fine powders. The cool thing about these sponges is that the holes inside of them are about 50,000 times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. So you can imagine that the, the pore sizes in our materials are approaching that of, of small molecules like carbon dioxide and water and things of that sort. And what is so special about this material? Why, why are we, aren't we using it right now already? So these materials are very special in the sense that 
as chemists, what we do is we can go inside of these materials, like you would decorate your Christmas tree at Christmas time. We go inside these materials and we hang special functionality. And this special functionality can actually help us grab selectively certain contaminants over others. Then in addition to that, um, these materials have world record surface areas. So unlike the sponge that you saw before, I said that the, the pores in this is much smaller. Also the walls are atoms thick. So like you can access the outside of the material, you can also access all of the inside of the material. And this gives rise to record breaking surface areas. So this is one gram of material and this can have the same surface area as that of a European football field. And so what does this mean? This basically means that we can just put lots of contaminants inside, so we can basically use very little material to do a lot of work, so to speak. And do you plan on using it soon in the industry, for instance? So our group is currently working on scaling these materials up, so what you're looking at right now is a very fine powder. If we want to implement these in an actual separation, we're actually going to have to structure these materials, and what this means is we just simply take the fine powder and we form these into to small beads. Basically, we find a way to stick the small particles together, right? And so that's required in order to, to implement these in filter devices, and currently this is what we're doing in our lab is the structuring process, and we're trying to study our materials in very various application relevant gas and liquid mixtures. And are you working on other processes as well? Of course we are. So you can imagine we can design our sponges to extract carbon dioxide or heavy metals, for instance, from water. Um, you can imagine we can now design them to do a lot of other important uh, extraction processes. So one of those um, is related to the extraction of precious metals like gold. Currently the mining industry is consuming a lot of energy. Um, to extract these precious metals from the earth. And basically then we take those precious metals and we use those for a variety of technologically important devices like cell phones. The problem is, is that then we discard those cell phones back into the earth. And so um, basically what we're trying to do is make that process now circular rather than linear by um, being able to dissolve those metals from various devices into certain solutions and then we simply drop our sponges in and extract those metals. And so essentially we're using our sponges to recycle those metals now and make that process more circular, so to speak. And where do you think this passion comes from? Well, uh, I'll tell you, since I was a little girl, basically I, I grew up in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina. <laughs> During this time, I really spent most of my spare time outside of school, kind of outside climbing trees in the pastures and fishing and things. And so I, I just have a strong appreciation for the environment naturally. Then as I grew up, what I began to realize is that there are certain things we take for granted in developed countries. And I began to realize that many people throughout our world don't have access to the things like clean air and clean water that are so important. Um, and so for me, I began to, to think about these things, and I think that this should not be a birthright, access to clean air and clean water. I believe that this should be um, a basic human right. And so I'm trying to use my chemistry now to improve the environment and hopefully provide uh, clean air and clean water to people around the world. But still, you didn't want to be a scientist when you were young, right? Absolutely not. Um, I actually wanted to be a professional baseball player. Okay, burn it in. San Jose. When I was about five years old, my uncle taught me how to play baseball, and I, I had two older brothers and two cousins. We all played um, in the yard and, and even on an organized team. Um, and so I, I took this very seriously. At age 13, I switched from baseball uh, to fast pitch softball and actually continued this throughout the end of, of the university. And this is actually how I paid for, for part of my studies um, was playing fast pitch softball. And so now, even in Switzerland, since I've moved here, I've, I found a baseball league. And so I've played on several teams and I'm continuing to play, even in Martigny at the moment. In Switzerland? Yeah, believe it or not, there are multiple baseball leagues in Switzerland. It's very popular. Oh. 
And would you say there is a, a significant step in your path that made you shift to sciences? Yes, unfortunately, once I got to the university, I realized that athletics was a tool to basically obtain an education. And my desires to be a professional baseball player were, li were not very likely. And so at that point, I really wanted a career that challenged me. And so at the university, I'd taken many different types of courses. And throughout those courses, I just recognized that chemistry was something that challenged me. And I thought I could develop a future career in chemistry that potentially would give me new challenges that I would face every day. And so I could apply my skill set to solving problems, which is something that I really enjoy. And as a woman, did you feel more challenged than others? Um, I'll say as a woman, really, I think as any minority, you're going to, of course, face certain challenges that others don't simply because there's still a lot of bias in the world. And I think that um, biases are things that we're still not completely recognizing. So yes, throughout my career, I've seen certain things that I've had to deal with as a woman. But I think it's, it's, it's a thing that, that all minorities experience. Is it, is it a message that you want to share? The fact that women can actually do career in STEM? I would say yes. I, I would like to set an example for women. I think for me growing up, not seeing um, women in certain fields, when you, when you don't see women that represent certain fields, then you don't necessarily picture yourself as being part of that profession. And so I hope that being um, a chemist and a professor, that other women can see me and say, oh, you know, this is something I haven't considered. Maybe I can also do that. Um, but also, I just, I mean, for women in general, I just want to share that like anybody else, a woman can do anything that she puts her mind to, of course. And have you heard of the Pool Equity campaign at TPFL? Absolutely. Were you aware of this dis discrimination even on campus? I was not aware, um, but I'm not surprised. And so growing up in rural South Carolina, I was exposed to racism, sexism, homophobia, all of these things. And the problem is, is that <clears throat> if, if you grow up in a setting where you're around these things and this is all you know, um, you might get accustomed to an environment where th this occurs. And I can imagine that, that similar things can also happen in Switzerland. Um, so this campaign and, and what has happened is very troubling, but I have to commend those students for, for standing up and telling their stories. This is so important because I think the first step to change is actually recognizing that there is a problem. And we can't do that if we don't have people that are brave enough to stand up and talk about their issues. And to lighten up things, let's take a look at Today on Earth. Merry Christmas to EPFL students rams more with exams than happy celebrations. This year, EPFL introduces a novelty. As Schrodinger's cat, exams may be simultaneously both online and on-site. But some students have already begun their preparation for this coming session. Some other students still need to catch up on their series and classes. But distractions are always welcome. Good luck for this end of the year 2020. Ah, uh, exam session already. But when you are so a professor, do you enjoy teaching at EPFL? I love teaching at EPFL. I would tell you that teaching is probably one of my most favorite things um, about being a professor. Um, teaching entails teaching in the classroom with students, but also you can imagine I have a research team in Valet and there is a lot of engagement between myself and them, particularly discussing research projects and things. And this is by far um, the best, best time, I would say, as a professor. And how about online teaching? Oh, well, online teaching, I'll say, is not as fun. The question is, how do the democracies respond to those scandals? And what will that mean for, for the wider region? I believe one of your children just walked in. Okay, uh, so the question then becomes, um, if it, North, I apologize. Uh, me? Ah, oh, there's your so, nanny. That's not my nanny, that's my wife. <laughs> and the reason is because I think as a professor, or at least for me, I kind of tend to feed off the energy of the students in the classroom. So by them engaging, asking questions, answering questions in class, and I think online teaching is a bit more difficult because there's less engagement between myself and the students, and then you feel like you're just talking into a box. Um, so online teaching is tough, 
and also the prep is to me a bit bit more extensive. And was this your first experience at TPFL being a professor? Yes, it is. I mean, of course, when you're going through a doctoral program and things like that, you do a lot of a lot of teaching. And so I had a, a extensive teaching experience during that time, even instructing uh, some graduate level courses. But yes, I would tell you that instructing an entire class was my it was my first time here at EPFL. And how is the Swiss life compared to uh, Berkeley or South Carolina? <laughs> well, you can imagine that that is quite different. Uh, Berkeley, in fact, compared to South Carolina is so different. I mean, Berkeley is, is extremely diverse, very liberal. South Carolina is much more conservative. I would tell you that Switzerland's somewhere in the middle of those things. Um, the food, of course, is very different. The language is very different. Je m'appelle mon anniversaire à Primaire, May. Mais je vais célébrer Ben Tot. That was really good. The thing that I appreciate most about Switzerland is the quality of life. I think um, compared to all of the places that I've lived, including just outside of DC in the US, um, this place has the best quality of life compared to all of those places because there's health care and a lot of things that we don't necessarily have in the States. Then let's learn more about Wendy with her logbook. Teaching or doing research? Teaching. A cat or a dog person? Definitely a dog person. French or Swiss wine? French. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Tradition, authenticity and passion. Les trois mots qui caractérisent le mieux les vignerons et les vins du canton du Valais. Ici, ce sont des valeurs fortes et respectées. So, dogs and French wine, is that what your life looks like outside of work? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so when I moved to Switzerland, I brought two, two dogs, one huge mountain dog with me, and so we, we enjoy hiking in the mountains and the vineyards. And since I live in the vineyards, well, I naturally started drinking wine when I came to Switzerland, and I've been traveling in Italy and France a bit, and so I've learned to love French wine, as well as Italian wine, and I'm warming up to some of the, the famous reds and whites here in Switzerland as well. And what about dogs? Is, th is that also a passion of yours? Absolutely. I've always had dogs. Um, when I was young, my father actually raised chows, so he, he raised these dogs basically for, to sell. And so I was always surrounded by dogs and, and, of course, other types of animals as well. I think at one point we had as many as 30, 35 dogs, something like that. Um, and as I grew up, I would request different types of dogs, so bulldogs and, I mean, golden retrievers. And I, so I was just always surrounded by dogs. I don't know if this is why I love dogs so much, but um, certainly it had an influence. You seem like such a passionate woman. Really, I hope that you can stay around a TPFL as long as possible because you're very inspiring, I think, for students. Did you have a last message to end 2020 on a high note? This year was supposed to be great. Well, it's only the second day and I'm a loser with stupid leather pants that don't even fit. Um, so 2020 has really been quite tough. I think for all of us, but I think it's very important that we focus on the, the positive things about 2020. Some of the positive things for me um, is that I've learned how important connectivity with friends and family is. I've always recognized that, but I never recognized it to this extent. And also I think that with our experience, for instance, with COVID, that we're going to find new ways to work and I think uh, potentially some, some new ways to get better work-life balance. And so there are some good things that I think will come out of, of 2020. Perfect. Wendy, sustainability, dog walking, baseball, and inspiring the next generation. Enjoy Christmas and New Year's Eve and let's celebrate the end of the year 2020, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Merry Christmas to each single one of you watching us today. Take care of your loved ones and be ready for a new year full of hope and new personalities at the Galactic Cloet Show.